you all. All right. Up next on our agenda tonight is a uh, report from the Feasibility Study Committee between Mid-America Hotels and the City of Cape Girardeau regarding some very exciting developments in town. Uh, Julie, you got a minute. Would you come forward and just kind of tell us what the routine is going to be so we can understand what we're getting ready to see, what we will see, and ultimately maybe even what the answer already is? Yes, thank you, Councilman Lanzati. I'm Julia Thompson. I'm the Parks and Recreation Director for the City. And um, Scott's going to give a little bit of an overview of how all of this got started. And after that, um, I'll talk a little bit about our committee process. And then the consultants will come up and give their presentations. We have two consultants this evening. One will give the presentation on the hotel uh, conference center. And then our other consultant, um, Darren Barr from Ballard King and PDS, will give the uh, report on the um, three other facilities, uh, sports related. And then after that, we'll have a brief wrap up. And um, then uh, I believe we'll also, uh, Scott will direct us about uh, the council decision and vote. So Scott, yeah. give us maybe a little bit of a background on all of this. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Julia. We're, we, uh, if you recall, Council, that uh, th this committee was put in place by a uh, amendment to a settlement agreement which you, which Council approved um, several months ago, and uh, and and that um, that amendment to the settlement agreement uh, called for a committee made up of three Mid America representatives, uh, which are uh, Diane Jury Edwards, Joel Nykirk, and Randy Kluge, and then three city appointments, of which we which uh, you all made with Danny Esner, Kathy Bertrand, and Craig Billmeyer. And uh, of course, we'll want to thank them tonight for, all, for their service as they took on this task. And their task was to look at uh, four different um, possibilities of a facility to build with the remaining restaurant tax and, uh, and weigh them uh, regarding their impact to the, to the uh, economy as well as to the um, hotel, uh, filling up hotels and those types of things and come back with a recommendation uh, regarding uh, which ones they think should proceed with and if there are the ones, if there are multiple ones, to prioritize those. The four were the, an Ag Expo Center, an indoor aquatics complex, an indoor sports complex, and a hotel conference center. So uh, they uh, we, we hired a consultant to take a look at the data, to bring that data forward, and, and then to have discussion, which was ultimately uh, to be decided by a vote by that member, uh, six-member committee. Um, one of the things in the, in the agreement was that, uh, that $5 million would be used for a police station, or uh, if a use tax were passed, then that $5 million would not be used for that. Um, so they bring tonight a, a recommendation uh, based on the data that uh, was outlined, and uh, you as council, in your minds, will, will either accept or reject, uh, but you cannot change their recommendation, and that's according to the agreement. So that sets the stage, and uh, we'll turn it back to Julia to uh, uh, present uh, the information tonight and ending with their recommendation. Great. Thank you, Scott. And I just wanted to, uh, again, recognize our committee members. If our committee members could please stand, because over the last nine months, we have worked with this group uh, to um, just go flush through a lot of information, stakeholder meetings, um, all types of data that uh, they gave of their uh, free time and um, Mark, I tried to work with our council representative's schedule. He, Mark attended when he could. So I um, just really want to appreciate uh, all of the work that they did. And so um, I don't know that there's a drum roll. Uh, there's really, I think if you've seen the paper, you've seen some of the information, um, we know that the recommendation for the facilities is going to be um, the, sports com the indoor sports complex. Um, that's not a secret. But getting there, it, it took a while. Um, it was one of those things that um, you're going to see uh, the consultants talk about a little bit more. But all of the projects were viable, and all of the projects are valuable in their own way. Um, so I want to introduce uh, Hans Deffelson from HVS Consulting. He's going to talk about the Hotel Conference Center. And this was a study that was initiated a while back uh, that was um, held up, or uh, I guess um, it's the study ceased when it was found out that 
the cost of subsidy was going to be high for the city, and it was also during a time when our economy was still um, struggling. So when we came back with this agreement, it was decided that let's study the combination of a hotel conference center as a more viable option, which Chuck Martin from our Convention and Visitors Bureau was uh, wholeheartedly endorsed. So it was Hans and HBS's responsibility to kind of uh, review that data and that feasibility gap and in information. So uh, Hans, if you want to step up here and then talk to us a little bit about um, your experience and then the work that you've done for us. Great, thanks a lot, Julia. And uh, thank you, Council, for inviting me back to Cape Girardeau. Nice to be back. Um, as Julia mentioned, I think about three or four years ago, we started uh, an initial study for a conference center. And uh, bas the basic conclusion was, if you really want a conference center, and you can not only subsidize its construction costs, but also subsidize its operations every year, then do a standalone conference center. But that uh, probably wasn't uh, something that was going to get a lot of traction, so uh, about a year ago we started looking at an alternative option that would be a hotel conference center that might need some upfront subsidy to overbuild the conference space in the joined hotel conference center, but would not require any sort of ongoing operational subsidies. So uh, I just selected 12 slides to kind of summarize the kind of key recommendations and results from this Ho joint hotel conference center study. And um, <coughs> again, I just I want to point out that our, our role is just to be an independent consultant to uh, offer feedback on, on this sort of a project. We're not advocating uh, for the project or not, but if the city decides to do a project like this, we want to give you the best information you can have. So uh, if you do build a hotel conference center, our recommendation was that you focus on an upscale chain scale um, and specifically focus on a national brand. Uh, brands, national brands in the upscale chain scale that you might recognize would be Aloft, Cambria, Courtyard by Marriott, Hilton Garden Inn, Hyatt Place, Indigo, and Spring Hill Suites. Uh, breaking that down further, uh, our specific recommendation would be to look at uh, one of those Marriott brands. And the primary reason is because there is no Marriott product in the Cape Girardeau market. And, and for being one of the strongest and largest reservation systems in, in, in the world for hospitality um, facilities, you basically are about an hour away from the nearest, nearest Marriott product. So um, we recommended 155 guest rooms. 20,000 square feet of conference space, um, amenities that this facility should include, uh, a restaurant, a lounge, indoor pool and spa, uh, business center, guest laundry, um, and a convenience, convenience store. One of the tasks um, that the committee asked us to look at was how could you do a project like this and maximize the economic impact or maximize the number of induced room nights that, that a project like this could attract to Cape Girardeau that otherwise wouldn't be coming here. So um, what we identified was three types of induced demand uh, that a project like this could uh, bring to Cape Girardeau. Um, and the upper right hand corner of this little matrix shows you why we're recommending the brand and the chain scale that we are. Uh, it's because you get the highest economic impact or the most induced lodging demand. Uh, and essentially, um, any scenario with the conference center is going to have some induced demand from the conference center itself. Uh, but by picking an upscale hotel, you'll also induce demand that's currently not coming here because there, there is no hotel product in the Cape Girardeau market right now uh, above the upper mid scale. Uh, as hotel hoteliers have these chain scales. So the, the best hotel product in town is an upper mid-scale hotel. We're recommending if you do this project, you uh, select a hotel that's going to be at least one chain scale higher than what you've got now. That will attract some additional new demand. Uh, and then finally, the brand selection uh, of a, a Marriott brand would in induce a third uh, tier of induced demand to this market because you currently don't have 
a Marriott reservation system in town, uh, you know, doing the heavy lifting of attracting uh, Marriott Rewards customers to this market. Um, one, another thing we wanted to look at was take a look at the existing facilities in town and make sure that we're not recommending a duplication of what already exists here uh, in Cape Girardeau. Uh, so again, that played into our recommendation of the upscale chain scale and the joint hotel conference center, and you don't have that combination right now. Uh, this slide points out the fact that um, the, all these numbers are occupancies uh, of your, uh, your aggregate occupancies of your hotels in Cape Girardeau. So if you were to look across November, uh, the fourth road down, and look on the Monday column, you'd see an average Monday in November, like today, uh, your hotels are averaging 72% occupancy. Uh, when you start seeing average occupancies in a community above 70 and in a lot of cases above 80, that means some of your best hotels are selling out. And that is, means you're starting to turn away some demand that otherwise would want to be here. Um, you know, I can, you know, for example, tonight, average occupancies may be 72% on a Monday in November in Cape Girardeau, but the Holiday Inn Express is sold out. You can't get a room there tonight. So. Um, what this chart basically shows a person like me who's used to looking at hundreds of these a year is that you have a, a large amount of unaccommodated demand that is being turned away from Cape Girardeau that would want to be here during these peak seasons if you had uh, the capacity at the right quality level and price point. And we're estimating that that would add up to almost 27,000 room nights a year of demand that is being turned away because of these sellout patterns. In addition to that unaccommodated demand, I touched on uh, this concept we call induced demand, which is basically a type of demand that comes specifically because of an event or a facility that you build and market. Um, we're estimating that if you build a 20,000 square foot conference center, that would induce another 15,000 room nights of lodging demand annually uh, in this market. What we typically find is that uh, conference centers may induce about a half to one room night per square foot of, of rentable conference space. And we've, our assumptions are sort of positioned right in the middle of those survey findings. Um, and then on top of that conference center induced demand, I mentioned that the Marriott reservation system and the upscale quality of the hotel would also have an ability to induce some additional customers or lodgers to Cape Girardeau. And we're estimating uh, in, in this, once the property gets stabilized, that would be between four and 5,000 additional room nights a year um, if you were to take that recommendation. Um, and then, you know, the punchline for this facility, if you were to develop it, uh, we are projecting um, the two key metrics in the hospitality world are occupancy and average daily rate. And we're projecting that this property would stabilize at about a 70% occupancy level um, with an average daily rate in 2019 of $147. Uh, if you put that in 2013 dollars or today's dollars, uh, it's about a $125 rate. Um, this chart's a little small to see, but the basic punchline here is we think this facility would generate about $7.5 million of revenue annually after you account for all of its operating expenses, management, franchise fees, uh, maintenance, utilities, and everything else. There will be about $2.3 million of net operating income available uh, as profits or to pay debt service uh, at the end of the year in, in a typical year. So if you convert that $2.3 million annual income stream that the property produces into an opinion of what the property be, would be worth if you were to sell it, its market value, we think it would be worth about $26 million uh, on the day it opens. But we think it would cost about $34, $35 million to build the concept that we've recommended. So the difference between how much it would cost and how much it would be worth is the feasibility gap. We've estimated or quantified that feasibility gap to be 8.8 uh, .8 or about $9 million. 
which is fairly common for a project of this nature. Uh, conference centers typically are not um, sort of feasible components, uh, even if it's joined with a hotel. It tends to be a loss leader, so having some kind of a feasibility gap was uh, expected from the outset. Uh, I think the question is if you'd want to proceed with a project like this, uh, have a plan together for how you're going to close that feasibility gap. If you go to the private sector and ask them to build this $35 million product that's going to be worth $26 million, you know, what can you do to uh, eliminate that feasibility gap uh, to allow that the uh, private investment community to invest that other $26 million. Hans, so before you go on, just a point of clarification for the council, and that because Loretta and I both participated, we may know this, but others may not. The 34 versus the 26 is to build the whole project. Is that's that correct? Right. So that's both the hotel and the center. That's right. Okay, so a point, point may have been lost in your presentation, but go okay. ahead. Okay, yeah, that's a good point. So the, I'm talking about this as one project that is a hotel and conference center. Its total cost uh, be around $35 million. Its total value around $26 million. So close to a $9 million feasibility gap for the combined hotel conference center. Um, if you were to try to break that out, which we didn't really, um, the hotel tower itself may be close to feasible, maybe not quite, and the conference center itself, you know, could essentially represent probably about what that feasibility gap is uh, in really rough terms. So ways you could eliminate that feasibility gap if you wanted this project to happen in Cape Girardeau, you could think about uh, making a land contribution to uh, the developer. You could uh, set up, uh, you know, you could make the, abate the property's taxes uh, for the hotel and the conference center. Uh, you could look at other scenarios like um, occupancy tax rebates or uh, using some kind of TIF funding, um, offering a loan guarantee to the developers so he or she can get a um, higher leverage on the project through their bank loan than they otherwise would be able to get with their own credit. Um, you could bond finan finance the whole deal. You could bond finance the conference center and lease it back to the developer. Uh, using the city's credit rating instead of the developers. Uh, all of these things would be significant ways to knock down or eliminate that feasibility gap. Um, these are just examples of ways that I've seen other communities address a feasibility gap to close it. Uh, but, you know, there's uh, literally, I'm sure, dozens of uh, options and permutations that could be considered. Um, you know, I think when Julie and I were talking, we just thought it might be a good idea to share some of the successful tools we've seen used in other <coughs> communities. So that's really it. Wanted to say thank you again. It's been uh, my pleasure to get to come to Cape Girardeau, uh, I think, four times in the last three or four years. And uh, I've enjoyed working with uh, your city and, and uh, the representatives on the committee and be happy to answer any questions if there are any. Does <coughs> anybody on the council have any questions for Hans? Hans, thank you for all that you've done. You're it's uh, been a pleasure. I'm sure we'll see you in the future at some point. Right. I'd now like to introduce uh, Darren Barr from Ballard King, and he will be going through the remainder of our facility information. Darren? Thank you for your time this evening. Um, my name is Darren Barr. I work for Ballard King & Associates. We're actually a, a sub-consultant of Planning Design Studios and, and Jacobs Engineering. Um, we're a recreation consulting firm, so uh, we're not an architect or an engineer. So uh, like Hans and going ahead and bringing that third-party independent analysis, that was really our, our focus in this feasibility process. When we started this process, we were tasked with going ahead and looking at an Ag Expo Center, um, an indoor sports complex, and an aquatics facility. And in looking at those different types of facilities, we conducted a comprehensive market analysis, went ahead and visited with various stakeholders that would have interest in those facilities being developed. Uh, we went, undertook a benchmarking process uh, to look at other facilities in similar communities. 
Um, then from that, we developed some operational estimates and also spoke to the economic impact of each of those facilities. When we took a look at your market analysis, we identified three different areas. We identified an immediate service area of the city of Cape Girardeau. Uh, we identified a primary service area or people that would use the facility at least on a weekly basis as a 30-mile radius from the city center. Um, that information was gathered by visiting with the Parks and Recreation staff. And we also took a look at a, an economic draw area that went ahead and extended to the north past the city of St. Louis and off to the east and the west to include Memphis and Springfield, respectively. Some of the things that we made sure that we t paid attention to when we looked at that information is we went ahead and looked at some key, key indicators, um, took a look at the population numbers, what those meant. We even went so far as to create some unique participation percentages for various activities like baseball, softball, swimming, some of those types of activities so that we could quantify uh, what type of market there were in those areas. We were also sensitive to the fact that there's other providers in the city of Cape Girardeau. Um, we went ahead and we took a look at what those, what those providers were, how often they were providing services, and what kind of services that they were providing, and how any of those three facilities might factor into that overall market. Um, one of the, the most important facilities that we went ahead and took a look at was the Show Me Center and really having an understanding how the addition of an Ag Expo Center could impact positively or negatively that facility. So once we completed that market analysis process, we went ahead and we engaged these three different stakeholder groups. Um, fourth group that I didn't put up there, but maybe one that is equally as important was the current staff uh, with the Parks and Recreation Department. So engage them to have a good understanding of what their day-to-day -day and annual operation was like. Um, spoke with the Ag Expo uh, representatives and had an understanding of what they wanted in terms of minimum facility components, how often they thought they would use a facility of that nature if it was needed, um, the regional nature of those types of facilities, how far they travel, that type of information. Um, also visited with the, the, uh, the folks that primarily use the, the current 50-meter pool and, and its bubbled configuration. Um, wanted to have an understanding of, of what some of those minimum requirements were out of their facility. Uh, did they want to completely duplicate what they currently have? Did they want additional water? Um, so really having an understanding of what it was that they were looking for. And the same thing with youth sports. Um, in youth sports, we went ahead and we visited with the local college. Uh, we also went ahead and we, we visited with folks that represented tennis, uh, soccer, uh, baseball, basketball, volleyball, uh, really having a good understanding of what each one of those groups wants. Um, some highlights the Ag Expo wants. They were looking for a minimum arena of 150 by 300 space with minimum seating of up to 2,500 people. Aquatics was looking for at minimum the, the replication of the 50 meter pool that they have with the potential addition of an in, another indoor body of water. Um, also had a big focus on spectator seating. How many folks could we go ahead and could we seat comfortably making sure that nobody got pushed into the pool or anything crazy like that. Um, in youth sports, really looking at an at a indoor space that had uh, six basketball courts, 12 volleyball courts, also the potential for some indoor turf space that could be divided into multiple configurations depending upon the need. With that information in mind, um, we went ahead and we undertook a benchmarking process. The benchmarking process was merely it was designed in a way that we could have an understanding of what it costs to operate the facilities, the economic impact that the facilities may have on the community, and whether or not they were meeting the expectations. Um, we initially planned on meeting or investigating two facilities of each type. Uh, we took a look at the Johnson County, or the New Century Field House in Johnson County. Um, we had identified an additional private provider for an indoor field house. However, they were um, less than willing to share information given uh, some previous history of, of people uh, borrowing that information, let's put it that way. Uh, so we looked at one indoor field house. We looked at two Ag Expo centers, one in Williamson County, Tennessee, uh, one in Western Kentucky, uh, two completely opposite ends of the spectrum. Um, the Ag Expo Center in Williamson County estimated that on an annual basis they had a six to nine million dollar impact, positive impact on the community. Uh, but they were subsidizing that operation in excess of three quarters of a million dollars a year. Um, they're willing to do that because of the positive economic impact. 
um, the Ag Expo uh, Center that was in Western Kentucky um, on campus. Uh, significantly less cost to operate. Only we're uh, probably operating with a two hundred to uh, $350,000 a year total expense. However, that didn't account for utilities associated with that building since it is an educational institution um, and it functions as a classroom. They weren't paying any utilities. So uh, they were very, were significantly less concerned with, um, with the economic impact. Um, I apologize, I won't go back a slide, but when we did talk with the folks from Johnson County, uh, they indicated their economic impact to be somewhere in the neighborhood of approximately 27 hotel room, not 2,700 hotel room nights on a seasonal basis. So um, at this point, we were kind of getting the idea that you know two of the three facilities already did have a, a positive economic impact to the communities they resided in. Um, the final facility type that we looked at was an aquatic center. Uh, we looked at one that was located in Lawrence, Kansas that was actually adjoined to the high school. Uh, we also went ahead and took a look at a facility that was in Pleasant Prairie, Wisconsin. Uh, both of those had a significant impact um, because of the design and because of uh, proximity to population center. The, the facility at Pleasant Prairie, Wisconsin had a significantly larger impact. Um, however, it was also part of a larger recreation complex that included two to three ice arenas, some indoor turf space, and they operate as an enterprise fund. So that facility is it's mainly um, sustainable because it has between 12,000 and 14,000 members on a given month. Um, the Lawrence Aquatic Center was, was designed as a positive economic impact to the community. It is having that. However, that is with the idea that the city uh, subsidizes that total operation to the tune of about 40%. That was something that they agreed to do from the onset of the building. The initial projections were that it was only going to have about a 25% subsidy level. However, that dropped to 40 when some of the main occupants have ceased to uh, attract events to that venue. With all of the information in hand, uh, we undertook uh, a process of going ahead and providing some operational recommendations uh, for each of the facilities or some operational ranges for each of the facilities. Um, I apologize the print is so small to read. That's just to make sure everybody's not nodding off. Uh, hopefully everybody snapped, uh, snapped attention here. But um, in all seriousness, what we came to the conclusion is that all three facilities would have a positive economic impact to the community. Uh, construction costs for an aquatic seminar would range in the $15 million. An indoor sports complex of 120,000 square feet would be about $19.8 million. And an Ag Expo Center of approximately 110,000 square feet would be about $16.5 million. Um, with the aquatic center, there would be a significant need for subsidy from the community. Um, those facilities can range in cost to operate anywhere between 1.1 and 1.9 million dollars. That's a very broad range, I understand that, but that speaks to the variances in operation. How much of the facility do you have open at a given time of the day? How much staff do you have available? Um, same thing for an indoor sports complex where you have a range of 400,000 to 850,000 dollars and an Ag Expo Center, half a million dollars to 900,000. We provided ranges with each one of those uh, facility types in terms of the ability to go ahead and to generate revenue. Um, the, the facility that probably had the, the highest revenue potential was that indoor sports complex. It also has the, the second lowest or the lowest um, operational range as well. So of those three facility types, the one you're in all likelihood going to have to subsidize the least for the shortest period of time is that indoor sports complex. Um, we do these studies across the country, so I, it's always kind of an internal joke with me when folks go ahead and talk about wanting a competitive aquatic venue to be cash neutral or non-subsidized. Those are, are very, very rare opportunities. Um, the Ag Expo Center, as we saw with our two benchmark facilities, really vary based upon how you operate those facilities. In terms of uh, hotel impact, um, we went ahead and, and with the aquatic center and, and using the, the number of events that that facility would attract, um, would go ahead and would result in somewhere in that 4,000 to 5,000 hotel, new hotel room nights um, on an annual basis. 
It's, mm -hmm. it's worth noting that with your current aquatic operation, you already do see a positive economic impact from, from that facility. This would be on top of that. Um, for an indoor sports complex, you're talking in the 4,500 to 5,500 range, and the Ag Expo Center somewhere in the 2,000 to 3,000 range. It's also important to understand that these are what we estimated as year one estimates. Um, it's not written in stone, but these are conservative estimates based upon that. We wanted to go ahead and give you an idea of what the first year might look like, not necessarily you know, year 10 or year 11. Given that information, um, the recommendation of the consulting group is that you would go ahead and pursue an indoor sports complex, or that would be the facility type that might be most beneficial. Uh, when you talk about that indoor sports complex, you're looking at a venue with six basketball courts or that could be used as 12 volleyball courts. Um, we're looking at a turf surface. When we go ahead and we talk about turf, we left that undefined so that if you're talking about one big piece of carpet, it could be subdivided into two larger spaces or three smaller spaces. Um, a as the Parks and Recreation Department becomes a renter of that space, if one team comes in and rents one section of turf, if they divide that up into three smaller groups, that's really their business, but the ability to divide and, and use it in that, fit, in that area or in that fashion. Um, we talked about the option of going ahead and having some team meeting room spaces, um, also having some potential uh, meeting room spaces for coaches meetings, officials, those types of things, and appropriate sport support spaces. Support spaces being restrooms, changing rooms, not sure that it would be a facility that you would need full-blown locker rooms for concessions areas, ticket sales, those types of things. When you start talking about an indoor sports complex, I think some of the, the positives or some of those things that went ahead and might have been a tipping point in going ahead and making a decision and a recommendation, um, this provides a new market for events within the community. Uh, currently, the, the city, the Parks and Recreation staff receives calls trying to solicit private um, private entrepreneurs going ahead and, and running youth sports events. You just don't have the critical mass of indoor facilities to do those within the community, not in one location. Um, there would be a significant, significant economic impact in the months of November to March. You're talking about indoor spaces. Not that those spaces wouldn't be used year round. They absolutely would, but you would get that key impact. With an indoor sports complex, you go ahead and you have a significantly better chance to reach 100% cost recovery over a period of time. Um, with the Ag Expo Center, depending upon how you configured that facility and definitely with the aquatic facility, uh, the future of those would, would be a significant subsidy from the city and the general fund. Uh, obviously, there's a lower cost to operate. There's also the, po the potential to phase a facility of this nature. Okay, We threw out a pretty big number at $19.8 million to go ahead and build a facility like this. Um, you could go ahead and you could phase this facility. So you could build the basketball and the volleyball first, the court space, because it, it allows you access to two sports, um, and add the turf at a later date. The existing market strength simply speaks to the fact that this is not a new venture for the Parks and Recreation Department. They offer events, they've gone ahead and, and they're well versed in running leagues and tournaments. Um, maybe not to this scale, but this is not something where there's going to be a significant learning curve for the staff. And I think when you go ahead and when you start talking about establishing yourself within the, within the tournament circuit, um, establishing yourself as a significant provider, um, it creates less opportunities for stumbles with staff. And if you've taken your kids to a, a tournament, um, it, it really doesn't have, it might have something to do with the facility, but the tournaments I hate taking my children to are the ones that are run poorly. Um, I'd much rather go to a, a lesser facility, but a, a, a more well-run tournament. I think your staff has the potential to go ahead and achieve that right from the start. Again, touching on some numbers, um, 120,000 square foot facility, that's an approximation. It would result in about a $19.8 million construction cost only. That doesn't speak to the total project cost. And that's factoring at about $165 per square foot. Again, we worked closely with Jacobs, and it, that's an approximate number, but they feel comfortable with that number. When we talk about operating expenses, um, 400000 to 850000 is that a good size range? Yes, it is. How much of your current staff can go ahead and can function out of that facility? What type of 
full-time staff should be included. Um, utilities for a facility like this are, are pretty significant where uh, the benefit of this particular structure is when you walk out at night you can ratchet those systems back. You don't have that luxury when you're dealing with an aquatic venue. Um, in terms of revenue potential, somewhere in that 350000 to 650000 range, um, that number can, it can obviously be refined. Uh, we've not taken a full operational analysis under our wing yet. Uh, that would kind of be next steps uh, to give you an idea of what the financial sustainability of this venue would be. Um, those dollars could be generated through tournaments, private rentals, existing leagues expanding, um, existing rentals expanding, new rental opportunities, new partnership opportunities, rental of space. Um, all of those things could be factored in to, to give you an idea of what the total revenue would be. I touched on it before, uh, but this is year one estimates. Um, it, those, when we went ahead and we factored in your economic impact and the number of days, that was based on somewhere in that nine to ten tournaments over the course of a year, so three, ba three basketball, three volleyball, three soccer. Um, obviously the goal would be to do more than that. Is there a realistic expectation that you could do more tournaments out than that on year one? Depends how hard the staff works. Um, but again, we think those are realistic numbers. Um, we talked about some of the alternative revenue opportunities to go ahead and, and to, to fill that gap. I think it's important that you understand that Okay, a $400,000 operating expense is nece not necessarily translate to $350,000 in revenue. A uh, $400,000 operating expense could be $500,000 in revenue. Flip side of the coin is true as well. Again, we won't really understand what that is until we go ahead, until we um, do a full-blown analysis of what the cost of operations are. Again, got, got ahead of myself a little bit. I apologize. Nobody's nodding off yet. Um, estimated 8 to 15 events in year one. Uh, total hotel room nights, 4,500 to 5,400. Accounts for 40% of the attendees. That was a big question when we went ahead and we started comparing aquatic venues to the indoor sports complex. How can we go ahead and how can we account for so many hotel room nights with aquatics? Part of that has to do with the number of attendees for an aquatic event. The other part of that had to do with the fact that you have to travel a significant distance to get to your next competitive swim team where you have many more um, basketball, volleyball, soccer in relatively close proximity. So those were the factors that we went ahead and that we, that we used. Um, one item that we did not talk about uh, was the, the other impact or the food, the gas, the, the spending and other um, and other institutions here within Cape Girardeau. We estimated that to be in that $400,000 range, so a significant impact on the local economy. Some tournament options that are out there. Um, obviously, your, your main three, basketball, volleyball, soccer. Uh, you're also talking about futsal being an opportunity, pickleball being an opportunity. Uh, I, my son is a wrestler, and tonight's the first night of practice, so I had to throw that in there, wrestling as an opportunity. Um, gymnastics, cheerleading, uh, again, you're talking about a big box with lots of options in there. I could go ahead and come up with more, but Julie and her staff, would I might get them way outside their comfort zone. So we'll start with this list. But our economic impact um, model was built off of basketball, volleyball, soccer. We didn't go beyond that. Uh, we stuck with the main three, but there are some other opportunities out there. Some other factors to go ahead and consider, and some of this information comes from the Sp St. Louis Sports Commission, um, spending spinoff. Depending upon which group that you're talking with, that $400,000 of spending, of other spending in the community, that can spin off another anywhere from 1.5 to 5 times and turn over again in the community. Um, St. Louis Sports Commission also goes ahead and set, suggests that in some instances, depending upon the size of the event and the level of the event, individuals in the community coming to the community may spend up, upwards of $35 per individual per day. The factor that we used when we developed these numbers was $25 per individual per day. So again, taking a conservative approach. The other have, you have other sales tax implications that could come into play. You have part-time job creation. Um, and that part-time employees, their flexible spending within the community. Um, again, talking with Scott today, just the number of part-time staff it might make to, 
have a tournament run, but uh, again, they're, they're here in your community and they're going to be spending those dollars. Approximately 5 to 10 percent of household expenditures is on entertainment and recreation within a community. Obviously, the, the white elephant in the room is how do we go ahead and how do we reduce our, our budget overage, our budget being our construction budget of $19.8 million. Um, we also, again, just throwing out some, some ideas, uh, the idea of additional funding via partners or with a different mechanism, um, reduced initial cost and the phasing, the, or the, phasing the, the facility and building that out. We already talked a little bit about the idea that if you were to do that, approaching the basketball and the volleyball, the court space as phase one, the soccer as phase two, um, would probably get you your biggest bang for the buck. Um, the other option that's out there is pur purchasing existing property and renovating, looking around the community and are those opportunities that you could take advantage of, how could you leverage those, um, can you go ahead and can you get a, a private owner to maybe feel a little philanthropic and, and look at it as a partner opportunity within the community. It's a lot of information. Um, I think some, some key points that I want you folks to, to walk away with is that the indoor sports complex is our rec recommendation at this time. Um, it's not to, to say either of the opportunities were, were less important, but when we took a look at the goal of having as significant of a positive economic impact plus the opportunity to go ahead and to get to the potential to get to 100% cost recovery, those were two primary factors in making that recommendation. Um, it is a business that you're currently in. I think that that's an important statement to make because it's not as though you're wandering off and, and starting something that you've never been involved with before. So um, next steps in terms of this process, uh, the team of uh, Planning Design Studios and Jacobs Engineering and Ballard King and Associates, if we were to take next steps, would be going ahead and, and looking at what a floor plan might look like. Uh, getting a better handle on what those construction costs and total project costs might be, maybe doing a side-by-side -side comparison of this is what it would cost to renovate a facility, this is what it would cost to build from new. Um, having an understanding of what the property needed to achieve a facility like this might be in terms of total acreage, parking, and those types of things. And while, while Andy and Mike will, will talk with you about making sure that you're environmentally sustainable in, in your construction process, the third part of that process would be to go ahead and do a full, full operational analysis so I could talk with you about um, the operational sustainability of a facility of that nature. So, yes, ma'am. Good question. Does the sports uh, facility you're proposing, is there space and planning for visitors and, and spectators? When we went ahead and when we took a look at that, um, yes is the, is the quick answer to that. If we were to look at that 120,000 square feet that would accommodate spectator space around um, around basketball courts and volleyball courts. Um, we've not gotten into the sitting down and drawing those things out. Um, as, you, as you look at the cost estimate of $165 a square foot, that probably accommodates for some tip and roll bleachers, but adequate space within, between the spaces. So you could put those in place. If you start talking about fixed seating or retractable seating and those types of things, you're going to see an increase in the total square footage. But we understand that that is something that's going to be important, especially if you're expecting a significant number of spectators for different sporting events. Any other questions from the council? It's very, uh, very informative. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Yeah, well, I, I um, uh, Julie, do you want to wrap up before I do the next steps? Or? No, I think there's, I um, just wanted to highlight again with regards to the recommendation. Um, we worked very, very closely with our um, partners in the community. Uh, Will Gorman with the Show Me Center uh, was probably at the majority of our meetings, um, along with some of other folks from the rec centers um, up at the university. Um, the university is currently running out of space. Um, they often come to take a look at us for usage for facilities, so we were very, very in tune and worried about uh, making sure that the Show Me Center was completely understanding about our goals. And I think if you were to speak with Will today, um, he would agree that, and along with 
Chuck Martin, who works with, um, you know, attracting events to this area, uh, that an additional space for sporting events um, would probably be very, very well received by the Show Me Center uh, as well because they currently cannot accommodate all that they have. And they're getting ready to go and undergo renovations um, this next year. So um, it was my pleasure to help just facilitate this uh, group and work with this committee. Um, our Parks and Recreation Department provided information. Um, we would love the idea, you know, to entertain the idea of a sports complex, but we like all of the facilities and um, would be happy to answer any additional questions that you might have. Any questions? Scott, before we, did you have any, Joe? Before we go on to, I wanted to take it, take this time because I don't know who's sticking around and who's not, but uh, there was great, uh, I think it was a great evolution in the relationship in that group in terms of the spirit of camaraderie and working towards a betterment of Cape Toronto, and I, I, I sincerely thank everyone for the time that we spent doing it. There was six people voted, but there were probably 20 people at every meeting, both myself, when you would let me come, and Loretta, I know we're at mo most, if not all, several members from the community who would, in, in some could perceive from the outside as being competing interest in this. And instead, we're sitting there cheerleading these on because of the, the, the very in, the inherent need of, of at least in some aspects the indoor sporting, but also the importance in some of, of the other projects that were, were out there as well. So, so thanks to everybody I got to spend some time with. Look forward to working again in the future. So. Yeah. Well, um, in, in terms of next steps, uh, Council, just to, to be clear that uh, tonight uh, asking you to endorse uh, the recommendation of, uh, of the committee. The committee unanimously uh, endorsed the uh, indoor sports facility, uh, and, and they, they left open the idea, and, and part of the agreement said uh, they wanted them to look at whether or not a CVV uh, partial location or location, full location in the new facility would be a, a good option. They said, you really don't know that until you find out where it would be. So they left that door open. Um, we didn't feel like they could uh, go either way until they know more. Uh, but if, if uh, council tonight endorses the project, uh, confirms basically the choice of the committee, then uh, staff will go to work beginning to drill down on the on design elements, the possible locations, uh, as, as was already talked about, and we'll be getting some help to do that. But we also have to drill down on the operational costs. The operational costs are going to be incredibly uh, important here because of the, the operational commitment that has to be made if, if it can't be a break-even uh, operation. It's certainly our feeling and, at this point, the desire to make it a, at least a break-even operation. Uh, but we'll also be looking at, you know, could somebody come in here and, and would be interested in op operating it, uh, you know, for free? Uh, are there firms out there that would do that? Um, the other thing we have to look at, we'll need to drill down very quickly on, is to begin to look at bookings and see what bookings are out there. Um, especially if we would end up with a, an existing facility that would turn around quickly, uh, then we, we have to have a feel for that as well. What, uh, how many tournaments are out there and, and what can they book and how how much money could, uh, could, could you make in revenue that way. So uh, that, those are the next steps, and uh, those are the next steps that we would be uh, proceeding with uh, should uh, the motion be approved tonight. Yeah. Well, um, I know that we do have a motion on the agenda to vote on, and I am prepared to uh, make the recommendation that, uh, that the consultants have given us and I think many of you know I have quite a background on CBB and Parks and Rec and uh, attended the meetings and also was here when Hans was uh, consulting on the three or four years ago on the convention center. So uh, I do feel like I have a background to comment. And as I said, I'm, I'm ready to make the recommendation that the, the consultants have given us for the sports complex. I think it's pretty convincing. However, I think we have a tremendous opportunity here for partnerships with, with the hotel operation that perhaps maybe that we could, uh, with all these different ideas that have been given us, and I know there's been great a great deal of thought gone into this, and I, 
And I think we certainly have that opportunity now to make every opportunity available to us and explore that. And uh, as far as, I mean, with the, uh, the hotel and the convention center, and also the Ag, uh, Ag Expo, I mean, with all of our outdoor activities as well as the indoor co uh, sports complex. I mean, this area is so, you know, involved in, in um, outdoor, you know, hunting, fishing, agriculture. I mean, I don't think we've ever really uh, cashed in on all the agriculture in our area. And perhaps there we can also have, we know we could have a partnership. So uh, I think, you know, I'd like to see the aquatics co uh, complex also, but th that does seem out of our reach. But I think we have three tremendous opportunities here that I think with the proper uh, partnerships and the study that, you know, has already gone into it, I think that that's what I would be prepared to make the motion. Thank you very much. Certainly are blessed. Anyone else? Uh, at this point, uh, we're at the, the thanks again for everybody for attending. Uh, we're moving on down the uh, study session agenda, which brings us to appearances for items uh, by any individual for items that are not on the agenda. Is there anyone in the 